right. So hopefully we are live. Hopefully you come up with something that your group can come up with for a planted answer to today's critical thinking challenge. But just as a way of going back and sort of reviewing where we were at and the reason that we segue into this critical thinking challenge at this point. So we started talking about the production era and this idea of if you build it, they will come. And lots of companies still use this as their model. If you are an innovator and you have a product that people are really going to be attracted to, you can probably still use this philosophy. And I've given you the example of Apple and Microsoft. Now, Microsoft may not be able to take that attitude for much longer because there are other iOS or there are other platforms that are coming up and are being developed. And as more and more people go to mobile stuff for everything, um, there are platforms that have been developed for the mobile market. And they're not the dominant platform necessarily in that market. And more and more people are using this device for almost everything that they do. But to this point, Microsoft has been able to use this philosophy of I'm going to build something, I'm going to push it out there, and everybody will use it. Because the vast majority of these devices, like the laptop that I'm using to record this on, and these desktop computers, have used Microsoft Windows. And so they've been able to push out really crappy, in my opinion, really crappy uh, operating platforms and get away with it. The sales era comes about as a result of the fact that once we get into the Industrial Revolution, we start seeing more and more people enter into the marketplace and we see consumer goods being mass produced. And so it was no longer enough to say, if you build it, they will come. You're going to have to start seeing some differentiation. And the example I gave you was, of course, Ford builds the first mass produced automobile and you could have that automobile in any color you wanted so long as that color was black. Well, then the Dodge brothers came along. I don't know if there were people before them or not. I'm not a, a historian of automobile history, but you know, at some point the Dodge brothers come along and it's no longer acceptable to just build a Ford Model T. There, there people want differentiation in the market. As we get more and more mass produced goods, then the shift uh, the focus shifts from just producing stuff that people will buy to actually having to go out and sell. And this is where most of the pejorative feelings come about salespeople is from this era. And this is transactional selling. It's basically creating awareness, interest, desire, and then action. We call it the ADA model, A-I-D-A, -A, awareness, interest, desire, and action. And so you would have salesmen that went out and traveled the country and made a pitch to sell your product and try to get people to buy it. So you put your product out there. How do you create awareness? Well, you can have an ad. <clears throat> then you have salespeople go out, sell the product. There's a company that's still in business today called the Fuller Brush Company. They don't sell brushes door to door, but they used to. They used to have door to door salesmen that would go out and try to sell women hair brushes in the door to door thing. So you might see an advertisement in something like a paper back in the day, in the early industrial revolution, or a magazine. Sears Roebuck catalog had something called the Wish Book. And then you would have salespeople that would go out and try to sell. And so from 1920 to 1960, we get this sales era where it's about, you know, I'm going to go with my fuller brush set and try to sell as many fuller brushes as I can to women door to door. Lots of vacuum cleaners were sold this way. Electrolux started out being sold this way. Anybody remember anybody's grandmother have a rainbow vacuum cleaner? You all don't know what a rainbow vacuum cleaner is, do you? The big thing, they were sold door to door as well, rainbow vacuum cleaners, I remember somebody, and they conned my mother into buying one. The rainbow vacuum cleaner was different because what it did is instead of having a bag, it had, you filled it with water in, in, in the base, and then you could put this scent stuff in there that would make your room smell good as you were vacuuming, and all of the dirt got trapped by the water, and then you just pour the water out. And the idea was that it was supposed to be much more healthy, it was supposed to pull a lot of the impurities out that you had, 
and put it into the water and trap it there and so that you could then just take it outside or somewhere and, and dump it dump it down the drain or, or anything like that. And why is that better than a bag? Well, what happens when you take a vacuum cleaner bag off the vacuum cleaner? You got it. Yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, if you do it inside the house, you've got all of those dust bunnies that you vacuumed up, at least in the room that you have uh, released the bag in. And so um, Rainbow came up with this idea that we'll put it all in the water, and you can see how much dirt you're getting out of your out of your house because your water will turn brown and dump it out. It's, it's great, isn't that fantastic? Of course, now we've got bagless. That's become the new big thing is to have a bagless vacuum cleaner so that you don't have to deal with bags anymore and you don't have that cost of changing the bags. So the sales era starts to differentiate uh, in the marketing era. It's no longer just good enough to build it and they will come. But we're going to have salespeople. And again, this is where a lot of the pejorative attitudes come about salespeople. And so one of the biggest things that we have to overcome in our department when we talk about professional sales is this idea that it's not just about transactional sales, this transactional selling where I'm going to make a pitch to you, I'm going to get your interest, and I'm going to get you to have a desire, and then I'm going to sell it, and I'm going to move on down the road. Now, this philosophy is still used, and you see it used in a number of uh, places, in a number of varieties and contexts. You see it used on infomercials. How many of you have watched Late Light Interview? If you have insomnia like I do, you turn on the television and they're selling all kinds of stuff on you know the on the television QVC anybody watch QVC a Lori Grenier from Shark Tank on QVC selling stuff that's transactional sales we're gonna we're gonna pitch the product get some interest and and get you to buy the guy that I think of when I grew up watching these was Billy Mays many of you remember Billy's dead now they've got a new guy that took Billy's place but Billy had all these products that he that he pitched for that were supposed to be the greatest and most wonderful thing on the planet and solve all your problems. And some of them worked okay. Probably the most successful thing that Billy ever marketed that actually worked about as well as he said it did was OxyClean. How many of you have used OxyClean? Billy started selling OxyClean. And it really does, it actually is kind of an amazing product. It does work pretty well on taking stains out. I can tell you it doesn't work. You know, Billy would do these demonstrations where it was like, you can get drug dug in grass stains out. And I tried that. It doesn't really work that well. I mean, you really have to kind of screen. You know, you just squirt a little of it on there and you just see the stain fading away. And it didn't work quite that well, but it does work pretty well. He'd say you didn't take out ketchup and blood and all these other things. <laughs> and it sort of works, you know, but it's it's not a bad product. The other thing that he really pushed that I really that actually worked as well as he said it did was something called Hercules hooks. And you can still buy these at Bed Bath and Beyond and places. So if you have a wall that's got sheetrock and you want to hang a painting, how do you want to hang paintings? Well, if it's a heavy painting, if you go over to my office, for example, in Badger Hall, if you come to see me sometime, I have all my office hours before class from six to eight in this classroom. But if you want to come after class, I'll be over in my office in Badger. You'll have to cross the Sahara Desert, you know, which is that little grassy spot. That's what students seem to think that is. When I pass back exams. For example, I'll bring them one time and students will say the next time, I wasn't here last time, can I get my exam back? And I'll say, we got to come get my, to my office to get it. So, oh, never mind. You know, I might as well be like Egypt to go to Thatcher Hall. And then you couple that with I'm on the third floor and the elevators on the other side of the building and nobody ever wants to go. <laughs> but should you come to my office, I have a lot of artwork up. My mother owns an art gallery and a lot of it's pretty heavy. And so, if you have a house that has drywall, which most people do anymore, the homes are not built with lath and plaster, they have you know studs between uh, various intervals in the wall. And if you want to hang art on the wall, you've got to find it's fairly heavy. In the past, you had to find a stud. Well, Billy came up with this product, or somebody came up with a product that he marketed. It was called the Hercules hook that allowed you to hang up to 200 pounds on a wall without finding a stud. And you didn't need a hammer. You could just shove the Hercules hook into the wall, it would turn around and curve to the back, and you could hang your painting. And it actually works pretty well. Um, Orange Glow was another thing that Billy came out with, or somebody that you know worked for Billy came out with. And it was supposed to take care of your hardwood floors, and you'd never have to ever redo them in terms of putting on polyurethane or wax ever again. And you know, he'd take the grinder and grind it on the floor. 
and then he'd squirt a little orange glow on it, and voila, it was supposed to be as wonderful. I can tell you, I have hardwood floors throughout my house, and it was not nearly as wonderful as Millie said it was. It worked okay. It had a little bit of polyurethane in it, but it's not not like it's you know been marine varnished, is what he basically sold it as. So that's the sales era. You still see this in things like infomercials, Billy Mays. My favorite event in the fall, and this is sometimes a test question, is the Oklahoma State Fair on the first exam. I love the fair because it's an opportunity to see everything that people would rather have than their own money. As a marketer, I'm fascinated by that. You go to the fair and they're selling, and this is the transactional sales type philosophy. You go into the various buildings, the modern living building, the Oak Made in Oklahoma building, and there are these people with these headsets on like they're Madonna or Cher, and they're pitching their steel pans that are supposedly non-stick. And every steel pan, by the way, is non-stick for the first couple of uses. It's when it starts to scratch that then it doesn't become non-stick. But, you know, by that point in time, they've moved on to another fair. They've sold you a $200 box of steel pans that are supposed to be non-stick. And they've moved on to another fair. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I don't know if this is a piece of crap. But they're gone, right? And so that's why one of the reasons that we see this sort of negative reaction. Which brings us to today's critical thinking challenge. I asked you to consider in your groups these questions. Is marketing an art or a science? And I want you to justify your example with, with your answer with three substantive examples. Is everything on a college campus that we teach either an art or a science? In other words, is biology an art or a science? Well, most people would say that's a science. Right? Is everything either that? Is Fine art, painting, pottery, sculpture, is that, well, most people would say, say that's art. Right? Is there some third category? And then what is the difference between art and science? And so I'm going to ask you to get up, and I will give you again some time next time to finish these up and then get those submitted to the Dropbox in your groups. But we're going to discuss these answers before we move on to the next philosophies in marketing. So is it an art or a science? Is everything in art or science? And what's the difference between these three? So I started, I think, over there, and then I started over here one time, didn't I? Mm -hmm. So this time we're going to start with the lucky group right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then I'll sort of decide who goes next. So you guys get to get up and give your answers to these three questions the best you have to this point for the live audience, the millions of people, of fans I have out there watching my YouTube channel <laughs> as we speak and we're live streaming. <laughs> you all are so energetic. <laughs> Just jumping up, leaping <laughs> to share your knowledge. <laughs> yeah, we'll just say what we saw that stuff. So this, this is Google Doc. Please go with it first. He's like super super. Okay, Joe. Okay. okay. The first question is marketing and art or science? Who wants to take that one? So we we came up with the the fact that it's both art and science. Okay. All right. How is it an art then? What's your what are your examples? Well, and if one of the, the examples we came up with it's like a like the creating of, of the packages to sell them because um for example for example um people tend to like like the fire stuff and stuff that's gonna catch your eye and the, then the um packages that, that has like the black or gray or whatever or whatever. Okay. and then if you if you're looking for something you can't decide normally I, at least for me i tend to go to the pretty packaging okay so you look at you look at the packages there's there's a reason why cereal yeah. packages feature bright colors and cartoon characters on it because it's attractive to kids. It jumps out at them and they, they want that spun sugar because, you know, Toucan Sam on the Fruit Loops is there. And so that's, that's art, right? Because you've got a drawing of this mythical Toucan that has various colors on his, on his beak that go around in stripes. Is that, is that what a Toucan looks like? Anybody seen a live Toucan? Not that many colors. No, they're not that many colors, right? So yeah, that's okay. So that's art. What's your next example? 
Mm, so we said it's a science because you know it's a study of data to know what you know what is what is in the market that people like. You know, okay. what people will buy and stuff, and so that they can you know, figure out how to sell it, how much to sell it, and all those kind of stuff. So it's kind of combining and collecting data. To okay, so you've got to you got to do some. Analysis, you got to go out there and see what people are willing to buy. They're, they may not be willing to buy just anything anymore. You're going to have to figure out what it is. Things like, well, as I said in the past when I was growing up, back in the dark ages, there were two types of milk. There was skim milk, or low, low fat milk as they called it, and then whole milk. And now you've got all these other things. Why do, why do people want a difference? Why do they want 2% milk or 1% milk? They're lactose intolerant and stuff like that. Okay, so that's that's why they want almond milk or soy milk or lactose-free milk now because they're lactose intolerant. Why would they want skim milk? Lower calories. Lower calories. Yeah. But, so that's the idea. It's actually, is there much difference in calories between, for example, 1% milk and whole milk? Does anybody know? The calorie differentiation is almost none. Because fat has very few calories, by the way. So, and fat doesn't make you fat. But at one point in time, people thought that if you ate fat, you get fat. <laughs> it doesn't. Eating fat doesn't make you fat. You can eat spun sugar and gain weight, right? Lots of carbs. Cake. <laughs> you, can, you can eat lots of carbs there and gain weight like a house on fire. Okay. What's your third example? Well, another example that I had. It's like, it's, it's art because like, it's a way to create the demand. And like, okay. at the same time, like, we are, uh, we are, we are seeing like a science to first create demand for products that are like, well, like we, we make computer, right? Right. So if we know the importance of computer, so we can use it, right? So it, it is another way which is making like, like uh, scientific use. So it's, it's, made, it's also a science. Okay. So it's also a science at the same time. Okay, at, at the same, it's a combination. Yeah, at the same, yeah. even in the same breath. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're saying like you develop a computer, you find out that people want that. There's science involved in that product yeah. development. There's science involved in finding out that people wanting it, but also then in selling it yeah. and making it attractive. That can be hard. Okay, I remember an, an ad. Dell computers used to have this geeky guy that would be on television. That said, dude, you're getting a Dell. Any of you remember this commercial? It's rather old now. That's art, right? The pitch, dude, you're getting a Dell. It, it's supposed to be hip and cool and make. Was Dell cool compared to like Apple? Mm -hmm. No, but they have. They, it. they have a one too, like where um, in the TV screen, you have the back of the Dell, and then where the Dell said says it's like saying like it's personalized to you, and then the Dell thing will change to a different set of things. Right. So you've got that. It was customizable. Okay. So you got your three examples. Is everything an art or a science? Is it one or the other? Uh, I'd say no, everything, I think, is a bit of a combination of both. Okay. Of art and science. Uh, I guess, case in point, first time I went to college was for, uh, I played the cello, it's a music degree. Most people would think that's art, but there is a lot of science behind it. When I had to learn how to do it, I'd have to know things like, the what point in history is this music? Like, is it classical era, baroque era? And I have to adjust the way I play it to make sure I fit in with everyone else. Okay. To make it sound more authentic. Right. So I had to specifically know the adjustments I had to make to do that. But then there's also plenty of you know the art part where I can express myself and do things like that. So there's a bit of a combination. I think most things probably yeah. can do that. Okay, physics. Physics. Art or science? Well, I know I had a physics roommate, and I know when he was solving all his math problems, there were multiple ways to get to the same answer. Some took much longer than others. To oh, the okay. Thing. So you can come up with different types of logical steps to come up with the same answer, maybe. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the difference then between art and science? I feel like the science part is like the uh, the nitty gritty, like specific knowledge. The 
this is how you do it. Artists, the things you need to know, or the artist, the way you can express yourself. Uh, if, you know, the wiggle room, how you do things could be different than how someone else does it. Okay. Kind of along those lines. And the art? Well, I mean, that was the art, the, the able to do it differently than other okay. people. And the science is like the details on how it, how we got to this point. Okay. So, you know. All right. What do you guys think of those answers? We didn't get any booze or any thumbs down, so that's good. We'll go with that group back there next. I'm trying to randomize it. So. <laughs> All right, so what did you all say? Is marketing an art or science? No, we said it's an art. You said it's an art. We took a hard stand. I like that. No middle of the road. You know, the only thing that survives in the middle of the road, or the only thing you find in the middle of the road is dead arm pillows. <laughs> Don't be a dead. Take a side. It's one or the other. I like that. So it's an art. How is it an art? Um, well, the first one we said, it, it kind of intrigues people. So, for example, you're trying to sell something, you walk into a room with different people mm -hmm. and you put your product or whatever up here, everybody's mind is going to go somewhere else. You may try to basically sell your product to them, whatever it is. Okay. And so, you, you put something up and, and people are going to have, if you have three people in the room, you're going to have three different reactions to it. Mm -hmm. You might have the good, the bad, and the ugly. One is going to love it. One is going to say, eh, okay, it's all right. I'm, you know, there's no alternative. I'll take it. And one's gonna hate it. Just absolutely. Okay. And then the second one we put it can be interpreted uh, in many different ways. Okay, so interpreted in many different ways. So we're all going to uh, agree that we're in principles of marketing at the University of Central Oklahoma at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, January 22nd, right? We can all look, that's, those are facts. But the things that we pick up on may all be different. Is that what you're saying? Like We're all sitting in this room. Okay, go ahead. Like everyone sees things differently. They take their own approach on it, so. Right, okay. I'd say it, like how we take this class as either an art or a science. You know, we walk in and you give a lecture about a certain, like the sales and how to go about it. But we would, someone would interpret it more as is that something like that's free flowing or is this more systematic? Okay. So is it just a totally random process? I just walk in and decide, you know, I want to talk about this today. And away we go. And it's the Granny Gary Comedy Hour. Or did I actually have some thought behind what I did and some method to the madness? Okay. And then the third one of um, Jet. Uh, Gillette commercial. You want to, okay. So I was thinking that as a more direct example. So the, the Gillette commercial was very controversial. So I mean, personally, I was trying to watch it, but you would just see more news articles about it than anything. So I took more to social media comments because that's mm -hmm. where you can find everything. So first you find like everyone's like, how dare Gillette do this? And they throw their Gillette shares in the toilet. And then you'll have the other group like, well, this is smart. It's teaching us not to be quote unquote monsters and be more courteous to everyone. Okay. All right. So Gillette comes out with this ad that's basically a response to the Me Too movement, which is you can, you need to, to be aware, you, you know, to be your best. Uh, and that was Gillette's motto forever is, you know, helping a man be his best or what, something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing, but to be your best, it also means to be respectful of that. And a lot of there's been a lot of blowback as a result. There, the people are saying, I don't want my razor to be political. I just want a good, clean, close shave. I don't want, the, I don't want Gillette's political commentary on the Me Too movement. Because, you know, I agree with Donald Trump. That we should be able to, you know, run around. And if you're a star, they'll let you uh, kiss them. Okay, dude, whatever. So, all right. In your third, uh, that was your third example. Yeah. Okay, so is everything an art or a science? Um, we said science, right? Yeah, we said science. Um, 
You said everything is in some ways. This is college campus, right? Like, right, on college. Okay, yeah. Um, the reason we said science is because it's kind of like the scientific method. Um, first day of class, when you walk into a class, right? You before you probably did research, look at the professors, reviews, and all that. And then if you don't like the class, that's kind of like your uh, experiment. You know, sit down. He says it's going to be a four page, four page paper you every day. And then you know, also after getting that information, you drop it. Then it repeats. You have another class. You walk in. You sit down. You hear what he says. Then it just repeats. Okay, so everything's a science. Like, we kind of took it from a different perspective, like how people interpret things. We didn't really look at it like a category or something. So, okay. like, as a student, we think everything has a science. Okay, you're constantly engaging in taking in information yeah. and making assumptions, which we could call hypotheses. This is something that resembles the scientific method. And then adjusting your reaction based on that information. So you think that's science. Okay. So then what's the difference between an art or a science? Um, well, art is subjective. Okay, that's the correct answer. Art is subjective and science is systematic. Okay. Yeah, which we would call what's the opposite of subjective? Uh, objective. objective. We would call that objective. Now there's a debate about that as to whether or not anything can be completely objective, 100 percent objective. Okay, what do you guys think of their answers? All right, very good. This group gets to go next. And you have one member who's gonna to have to do his personal introduction. So what are the three things that make you completely unique? Uh that's uh why why are you taking it up here? Look at the camera. Address your audience. Hi uh Mark Miller. I'm a creative thinker that comes up with a lot of ideas, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I understand where people are coming from easily. It doesn't take me long to pick up on what they're saying. And uh, I'm interested in learning. Got a good attitude about learning. Okay. All right. Very good. What do you guys think of this three characters? Okay. So now on to your answer. It's marketing and art or science. What did you all choose? Right, I think we said it's mostly a science, uh, but we've got. Uh, it's mostly a science. Yeah, we've we've got examples for both. Okay, so there's shades of gray there. That's right. Um, for example, businesses create hypotheses to develop and create interest in their product, so they know which method they use is most mostly effective. Um, for example, businesses will also develop surveys to identify target audience. Okay, that's yeah, that's a big part of science, isn't it? Is figuring out what your customers want. We use surveys to do this. You probably are asked to take surveys all the time. You get the Walmart receipt. You have the opportunity to win a five thousand dollars shopping spree. You will just give them a few minutes of your precious time and take a survey. Google now has. You can get paid instantly to take surveys. If you sign up with Google to take their surveys, you can get, you know, they'll pay you in, and you can use it for like Google Play. If they don't actually send you cash to your bank account, but you can use it to buy music and videos and things like that on Google Play. And they'll, they'll use geo-tracking locations to ask, you know, did you visit this restaurant or any, and then they'll ask you questions about it to figure out whether or not you like it, whether or not that's going to be successful for that business. And so that is science. Absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna do research, we're gonna observe the consumer, we're gonna get feedback from them, and we're gonna adjust accordingly. All right. So surveys is a good, good example. And then uh, for example, if our businesses will set themselves apart from others by treating marketing as an art to make themselves seem unique. Oh, okay. So what we consider unique is somewhat subjective. What I think is novel and unique, you might think is just old hat. And so there's some amount of interpretation. It's not an exact science to get that there. What I think is beautiful, that's one of the things that's been debated. There is an area of philosophy called aesthetics, which deals with whether or not something is attractive. And the consensus for most of mankind has been what? For most of human history has been that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It turns out maybe not true, but um, yeah, that's been sort of, you know, it's a subjective <laughs> analysis. You sit there and somebody says, Picasso is a genius. 
And I look at Picasso and think, my three-year-old could do better than that, right? In terms of painting people, okay? Um, and then our last example, um, it's a science because they use psychology to study the mind of the consumer. Okay, so psychology is a science and that is one of the foundational disciplines of marketing is psychology. Yes, we study the mind of the individual to figure out what they want. So is everything on the college campus an art or a science that we teach? Do we have something in the group? Um, I say that it's split with some subjects are science, some subjects are art. Like okay. um, obviously math is science. Um, is math science? I find that numbers are art sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Is math a science? The history of art is uh, I mean, history of math's art. Yeah. So you see that you can uh, angles and stuff, but that's first numbers. Just was like um, I think Farsi before Farsi started art or math, it was angles. So technically it would be art. But there's also certain so like that's that's problems. So that's a science. Yeah. But is math itself mathematicians will tell you that it's a science. Yeah. I don't necessarily think yeah. that it is. I think it's an art. You think math is an art? Yeah. yeah. Based off is I mean, yeah. It was based it's off like shapes and geometry yeah. figures. Yeah, but it's completely not math not is completely not. arbitrary. I mean the way we draw numbers and the way we, I mean it, it, that's oh. that's we could come up with all kinds of different shapes yeah. that represent the same thing. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that math, now mathematicians will tell you it's a science, but I tend to think that math may be the language of science, mm -hmm. but that it's not necessarily science itself. There are disagreements in math, and you can, you can get mathematical proofs that have no meaning in reality. They are pure logic, but they have no basis in reality. You can get pure mathematics, ever increasing degrees of abstraction, and that if it doesn't have some basis in reality, can it be a science? I don't know that it can. So is it that point, is it an art form? I don't know. Right? There are really tough questions in that. Okay. So what's the difference then between art and science for you all? You said art is an articulation of creativity and personal views. Science is studying statistics and providing proven facts. Okay, so personal, it, we're, we're dealing with the individual versus what we can talk about as the collective. I think there's something to that. So personal views, I like vanilla ice cream. Somebody else can say, yeah, vanilla ice cream is awful. I like chocolate ice cream. Well, that's a personal preference. Now we can aggregate those individual preferences into categories and see whether or not people prefer chocolate to vanilla. And that's a scientific study. You, you know, we could have a question, do people prefer chocolate to vanilla? And then we look at a population and we take a sample of the population and, and sort of study it. Okay. I think there's something to do that. What do you guys think of the answers? We will, let's see. Done this group, that group, that group. Um, we'll do one more group, and then you guys will have the advantage of having heard everybody go on Tuesday. I'm not sure that we'll get through. <laughs> And you all have one member who needs to introduce himself as the class. Make a pick. I'm James Horn. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite strengths is uh, my humor. Uh, very funny, I guess. And I like to make feel, people feel comfortable around me. You guess? Uh, yeah. Sounds <laughs> really tentative there. Um, also, I'm very good at math. Uh, I think that's a big strength of mine. I've always made A's in all my math classes. Uh, and also, I don't like to lose. I'm very competitive. So, all right. Yeah. What are you guys saying? <laughs> so, is marketing an art or a science? So, for the first reason, we got marketing is both because it takes both creativity and a study of human behaviors. So, okay. human fields, so, so you think it's a combination? A combination. Yeah. Do you think it's more one than the other? Yes, more art. You think it's more art? Mm -hmm. 
So you would say physics is more science and less art. Is that yes? Is that a true statement? Yes. Okay. And marketing is more art and less science. Yes. Why is that? Because I mean, for example, let's say you want to a cereal box, like you mentioned. Um, Honey Smacks, you know, the bear, mm -hmm. whatever. That's, that's a nasty cereal. I don't know why I chose that one. But <laughs> I, I like Honey Smacks. Uh, I don't even want to talk about Honey Smacks. Let's do Honey Combs. <laughs> honey Combs. So you got the bee, you know, he's cool and stuff, and he's attractive to the kids, the yellow, bright color. We have to study that and see, like, what. I think it's actually Sugar Smacks, by the way. Sugar Smacks. <laughs> I think that's what they call it. Sugar. Isn't it sugar? Is it sugar? Oh, what is it? Is it I, don't, I don't I don't want to say it. So. <laughs> but so but anyways, humans, you know, you gotta find out what colors attract humans, what shapes attract humans, uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So you think that that's more of an art mm -hmm. because it's more tailored to individual preferences. Mm -hmm. I guess is what your argument is. Is that your argument? Yes. Sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Final answer. <laughs> All right. So what's your next one? Um, let's get involved. Everybody. That's right. Yeah. Make every, make everybody suffer. Uh, number two. Mm -hmm. or the second. Um, we said that marketing is both an art and a science, meaning it takes research and applied science to. Okay. So there's research involved in it, okay, and it's applied. Okay. What's your third example? Marketing is an art because the way it is applied is unique to the individual. All right. So particularly in things like personal selling, some of you are, are sales majors in here. That's going to be you're going to have to read your customer and tell whether or not they're responding to you, and that's. Not necessarily very scientific. You're gonna, you know, have to be able to figure out what kind of cues they're giving you, and and be able to tell whether or not they want something or they're interested or they're just moving on. So is everything an art or science? Uh, we said yes, but it really depends on how you um, define art okay. or science. Like uh, with marketing, like uh, we said, it's an art because I mean you have to. Uh, know how to talk to someone, what, what words to tell them to make them agree with you or sell them your product. So like, it just, it honestly really depends on how you see art and science, like philosophy, if you really see, or like history, like we were talking about history, uh, like there's a lot of art in history, say paintings and there's, I mean, a fossil is considered art now. So okay. I would right. say, yeah, just, Really. So what's the difference then between art and science for you all? Um, art would be, I would think, all right, so science, I think it's more factual, it's okay. more um, algorithms, right. like how to do things, and art would be uh, mastering how to do it. Okay, so art... Science is factual, it's based on reality, mm -hmm. and art could be have no basis in reality. So basically if they do like a survey on what, all right, so if you're reading an um, advertisement and you see like red, yellow, green, blue, whatever, and so if they do a survey and says, uh, what color makes you look at that ad more, you know, and so like, right. That's science. Yeah. We're, we're going to say we're going to be able yeah, to no, decide. That's science. People, that's science. Right? And then, but whether or not the individual interprets it or sees it um, could be art, mm -hmm. right? The way they perceive it. Um, not everybody perceives things as the same. Some people are colorblind, for example, which means that they don't perceive what? They do perceive some shades of color, by the way. Colorblind does not mean that you see things in black and white. It's not like you're looking at a black and white movie. What does colorblind really mean? Yeah, red green usually is the one that they can't see. It's, a, it's usually red green colored lines, so they can't tell the difference between reds and thick sh shades of hue of uh, blue. All right, well, very good. We'll have one group left on Thursday to discuss theirs, and then we'll move on. There should be a drop box for those. I'll give you some time in class on Tuesday to finish those up so that you don't have to work on the outside of class.
and then we'll talk about marketing strategies. Mm -hmm. So that will be where we're headed, and then we'll move into the marketing efforts of my neighbor and the subject. Yeah, yeah. 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 the drop box there, so you should, it should be open. You only have to have one person to do it. The drop box on D2L. Yeah, uh, D2L. Okay, yo. Okay, yo. The drop box is on D2L. I got the Google Doc option. And I'm going like, to post a picture of the notes. That way, in our free time, we can all just type whatever we want.